Okay. Well, uh, welcome everyone for this special once in a lifetime event. And, uh, you know, truly it is. Uh, I want to thank both the law and journalism faculty for helping to make this happen. And I especially want to thank Moira and Laura for agreeing to come visit us here at Griffith College. Uh, we at the Irish Innocence Project at Griffith College are so totally grateful uh, for this opportunity. Um, although Netflix doesn't release viewer statistics, it's very clear that the audience for Making a Mur Murderer is absolutely unprecedented. Uh, when I interviewed Laura and Moira in January for the Irish Times and did a Q&A, I checked, uh, just before I interviewed them, uh, I did a Google News search and got 28.9 million hits. Uh, this unique and pioneering true crime series, Making a Murderer, that premiered last December, has clearly captured a staggering global audience. But before meeting at the Columbia Film School and before making, collaborating on Making a Murderer and actually making history, media history at least, uh, both Moira and Laura had other lives. Moira Demos is a fellow Massachusetts native and daughter of a colonial historian and psychologist who raised her uh, with uh, a worldview that uh, not everything is what it seems on the surface. In high school, she took a summer class uh, in film at the Massachusetts College of Art and has long been interested in telling stories with images and characters before majoring in women and gender studies in college, and then working as a film editor and electrician on films like Salt, Pollock, and You Can Count on Me. Laura Ricciardi graduated from Manhattan College in 1992 with a bachelor's in English and government before earning her law degree from the New York Law School in 1996 and then later practicing law at Quinn, Emanuel, Urquhart, and Sullivan. She has also worked as a production assistant on two episodes of a documentary series called In the Life in 2002. Together, they have absolutely changed the way we view the criminal justice system and have inspired us to ask for, or actually, no, demand more answers, and we welcome them both here today. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying that I'm especially proud of the contributions that Moira and Laura have made to the public discussion around issues of justice, innocence, and fair trials. As a pro project manager of the Irish Innocence Project at Griffith College, which is one of two of 68 similar projects, similar innocence organizations worldwide, that has both law and journalism students working cooperatively on cases I'm always particularly interested in promoting the respective roles of law and journalism in holding the criminal justice system accountable. Stephen Avery had two really capable, outstanding lawyers, and yet many believe that he did not get justice. Stephen Avery would likely be one more anonymous person sitting in a jail cell claiming his innocence were it not for the fact that these two women decided that it would be worth their while to spend 10 years of their life documenting his case. So I guess I would start off by saying, by asking, uh, what role do you think the media can or should play in covering cases like those of Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery's? <laughs> I always have more start. starts. <laughs> Um, well, Anne, I think that's, is this on? I can't tell. Okay. Uh, I think that's a great question because I think it's, um, it can be a really tricky thing what the role of the media is. Um, and in, in the States, I think it's quite different than it, than it is here. You know, um, we went into this project, I think, with the belief that the media and the press were sort of an external force, just kind of covering what was going on. But I think... What we witnessed and perhaps what you may have experienced in watching the series is what a direct role they were playing in, in the outcome of trials often. So um, I think, you know, when you look at 
coverage of cases, coverage of pending cases. I think the media needs to be, you know, regulated and, and kept in check in terms of what can be what can be really brought out to the public because it's not a it's not a popular debate, mm -hmm. guilt and innocence. There's there's a courtroom, there are rules of law and it, it's a jury that decides. So that can be very dangerous. But I, I think in this in talking about issues of justice and in, in covering, you know, what often gets gets missed by the public, I think the media can play a crucial role in trying to um, really trying to show a, a broader picture, you know, because there are certain people that, I mean, at this moment I have a microphone, but usually it's, you know, people in power that have microphones, and right. it can be journalists or filmmakers, you know, who have a different role than journalists, but who can dig a little bit deeper yeah. and find out really the rest of the story. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because um, I think part of what Moira and I witnessed and documented and, and tried to share with viewers was that um, the media, I don't believe the media were either aware or particularly concerned with whether they were having an impact on the cases they were covering. And I think that that's crucial, mm -hmm. that, that the media should be aware and should consider whether they're having an impact because they shouldn't have an impact. And, um, you know, for instance, there was a series of press conferences law enforcement held in November when this when the state descended on the Avery salvage yard and was searching for physical evidence in the case, law enforcement was holding daily press conferences. So they were on the salvage yard for eight days and every day Ken Kratz and Jerry Poggle, who is then the sheriff of Calumet County, Robert Herman, who was the under sheriff of Manitowoc, would, you know, trot out to the local fire department and hold a press conference. And um, you know, I think at that time it was incumbent upon the media to look at the types of the type of information that was coming their way from law enforcement, how factually specific the information was, and um, I think you know really should have checked themselves and thought about whether that information should be channeled out to the public um, because it it certainly could have been prejudicial. Right, and I think what often happens is. Very often, it's it's the prosecution that's, ca you know, capturing the media's attention, mm -hmm. and there's a reluctance on the part, often not necessarily in this these cases, but there's often a reluctance on the part of criminal defense lawyers to speak to the press. So there's only one side being put out there often. Yeah. So yesterday, uh, we had a meeting with the Irish Innocence Project at Griffith College. And at the meeting, I invited uh, the members of the team to submit questions that they would like to ask of you guys. So I hope you're game for this. <laughs> um, so the first question I have is, do you believe in Stephen Avery's innocence? And I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, but perhaps you you know, share your views. Um, well, I think it's important to remember like our different roles in than lawyers, than advocates who are fighting, you know, for a specific case, because maybe we can go back to, you know, why we chose Stephen's story in the first place. Um, so we read about, or we first learned about Stephen when his story made the front page of the New York Times in 2005, and the headline read, Freed by DNA, Now Charged in New Crime. So immediately that jumped out to us, you know, an exoneree charged with murder, we had never heard of such a thing. But beyond the just inherent dramatic story that that would make, the reason that we chose to, to dive into this and then chose to keep going as long as we did was, was the belief that, you know, Stephen's story would offer this sort of unprecedented opportunity to, to look sort of as a window into the system. You know, he was a man who had undisputably been wronged, been failed by the system in 1985. Mm -hmm. And we could look at exactly, maybe not at every aspect of what had gone wrong, but look with a large degree of certainty at steps that had 
gone awry right. and people that had done really wrong things. Um, and now here he was 20 years later stepping back into it. And you know, between 1985 and 2005, the public had become aware of wrongful convictions. They were nothing at the level that they are now, but it was clear that the system can make mistakes. But in that period as well, we'd had DNA technology advances. And there was a lot of, um, it was sort of a very convenient, oh, there's this terrible problem, but now we have DNA. It's, it's going to be better now. And you know, this was an opportunity to sort of test that theory. Right. Um, you know, when else can we look at the same person in the same place, going, stepping back into the river, so to speak, yeah. and is it going to go any differently? So it really wasn't, we were not there to figure out what had happened to Teresa. We weren't asking questions about the facts of the case. We weren't really concerned with whether Stephen had done this or not done this, but it was, the question was, was he going to get a fair trial? So, you know, that's how we went in, and that's sort of where we are now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it, it never was a question um, for us of guilt or innocence. It was, we were looking at the system and wanted to know whether, um, you know, as Moira said, whether the system had evolved essentially over the 20 years since Stephen's um, initial wrongful conviction. And um, so, did you, you know, think that that the system had evolved, or did you think the same issues were evident the second time around? Well, there are times, you know, during filming where there were things that actually shocked the conscience. You know, there were things that happened that I, I just had no idea could occur and in the you're American a lawyer. Criminal, yeah, in the American <laughs> criminal justice system. You know. And, what um, sorts of things? Well, um, you know, not that this particular thing went unchecked, but you know, for instance, we were talking about pretrial press, and you know, one of the local reporters from Green Bay sat down with then Sheriff Ken Peterson and asked Ken Peterson to respond to allegations the Averys were making that law enforcement had planted evidence against Stephen in the case. And you might recall from the series, Ken Peterson's response to that was, you know, the allegations of planting are ridiculous. It would have been easier for us to kill Stephen Avery than to frame him. And, you know, that, that to me is just inexplicable. I mean, the thinking, you know, what could be going through the mind of the sitting sheriff of Manitowoc County? I mean, the audacity, mm -hmm. the, you know, I mean, to, to say that on public television, unapologetically, you know, it's not, it's not as though it were a slip of the tongue and then he called the reporter back in the next day and said, you know, I, I don't know what I was thinking, I don't know what I said, I mean, um, so, so for us really this was, the series was about a look at the system and questioning whether it had evolved over that 20 year period and ultimately, because we were in production and post-production for so long, whether it had evolved over a 30-year period. And um, what we really began to focus on was the role of truth and justice in the American criminal justice system, and specifically, you know, how those two, um, how to prioritize those two, and whether we can live with not knowing. Right. What, can we live with the uncertainty? Can we in fact embrace ambiguity? And can we better define and understand the meaning of justice and the role of justice in the process? Right. Well, thank you. Uh, the second question I have is, what were the challenges, and I imagine they were many, in doing the documentary? <laughs> this was a self-funded project. So, you know, we read the story of Stephen Avery in the New York Times. We found out that, was it maybe two weeks later? I mean, it was a matter of days later he was going to be having his preliminary hearing, um, which is actually the first scene of episode three, if you've seen the series. And so the story was happening. There was no time to try to raise money or apply for grants. And if right. we wanted to do this, we just had to do this. So. Um, that's what we did. We were, we were sort of wrapping up our graduate studies at Columbia in the, at, at their film school. And so in some ways, you know, we had the time. 
you know, there was sort of an amorphous period of time where you were going to be working on your thesis project, and we decided to do this instead for a while. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, so that was very difficult. We, we had to dive in. We ended up moving to Wisconsin for basically a year and a half while the two cases you know, played out mm -hmm. through through the verdicts in, in both cases. So until summer of 2007, we lived in Wisconsin, at which point, in addition to our educational debt, we then had a ton more debt and had to come back to New York, where we lived at the time, and go back to work. So, you know, that was one thing, just trying to stay afloat, trying to keep the project going. We were able to secure a few grants, but, you know, 95% was through you know, paychecks. Um, and then, you know, the other thing about starting this project in November of 2005 or December, by the time we did our first day of shooting, was the media landscape and distribution models. And, you know, when we first set out, admittedly, we thought we were going to make a documentary feature. That's sort of what filmmakers did, that's what you saw either on television on PBS or maybe HBO in the States or in theaters. Mm -hmm. um, but it really was only a few months into production when everything about Brendan broke, which, you know, it changed the case, it changed the family's story, it changed the themes, everything, yeah. it changed really everything. And it, it seemed like there was no way this was going to fit into a, a one hour or two hour television slot. So that was a real struggle, um, to know that we had this story, this story that really was such an opportunity to share with people, and yet, how were we going to get it out there? Exactly. Um, so the challenge of staying true to that, turning down or not pursuing shorter formats, and um, you know, being first-time filmmakers, so we had to. We knew Amazing. nobody was going to say, oh, you have this project, why don't, <laughs> why don't we give you this money so you can finish? You know, so we decided to just to keep making it the way we knew it had to be, and so then by the time we brought it to Netflix, you know, we had rough cuts of three episodes, we had sketches of episodes four and five, we had an outline of the series, you know, so it was, it, it was by no means finished, but it was entirely conceived and we could show them what it could be. Right. But that, that, but that was like eight years later, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I, I guess I'm also curious, there's the financial challenges, mm -hmm. but there's also, to me, the emotional challenges. How do you stay committed to this project for so long um, when there's so much uncertainty? As you said, that, you know, what format is even going to be available to, to screen this work? So, mm -hmm. I don't know. We were constantly reminding ourselves why we took it on in the first place, and that, you know, never changed for us. So we, we embarked on this journey because we thought it was a unique opportunity. We thought that it would add tremendous social value. We hoped that it would promote a dialogue about issues we really cared about and thought were um, important. And so, you know, I think in a way we saw it as a gift which might be confusing to people. <laughs> um, but it, you know, it really, it was challenging, but we, we felt a tremendous sense of responsibility and that, you know, this wonderful opportunity. And in fact, you know, we had um, sort of imposed ourselves in a way on the Averys. You know, we reached out to Stephen Avery. We said, we want to tell your story. And so of course, we felt that we had made a commitment and we needed to follow through mm -hmm. and to, to be as thorough and to, you know, to do all the heavy lifting it would take to It's to such a through. huge responsibility and you did such an amazing job you know, upholding that responsibility. I agree with Laura, you know, the things that made us choose to do this are the same things that kept us going. <clears throat> um, but I think some of those feelings even intensified as we as we were working on it, um, you know, this was this was a really high profile case. This Stephen's story, Brendan's story, at least in the local media, was you know they have a thirty minute local news every night. Fifteen twenty minutes of that news every night was about the case for the year and a half. So 
it was saturated. They were talking about this, but you know, most of the story was not not being talked about at all. And you know, what was so important to us, even in, in how we structured it, how we were looking at it, was looking at the past and looking at the present through the lens of the past, which you know we believe is the way we should all live our lives. You know, what's the point of having history if we don't learn from it? So. Um, and yet we were seeing either history ignored, um, you know, the context of everything was just missed, or at times history being rewritten, people talking about the past and just saying things that weren't true. Um, so it became, that was another level of responsibility, that if we did not finish this, if we did not get it out, that that stuff would be lost forever. And um, it just, it was a lot of, um, a lot of pressure, but a lot of, you know, inspiration to keep going. Yeah. Um, the next question I have is, uh, what are some of the ethical issues, and this, you know, just kind of touch on some of these challenges faced by journalists and media producers when working on a documentary or a project about true crimes? I don't consider myself a journalist. Mm -hmm. I consider myself a filmmaker. Um, <clears throat> but. You know, certainly, I mean, there's a way in which, you know, I have a sense of what ethical obligations there would be. It's, it's not as though, you know, with, as a lawyer, you know, there's a code of professional conduct in the States and, you know, you can open a book and read what the actual rules are essentially right. and, and guide yourself accordingly. I don't know that anything exists like that for filmmakers. Um, that said, I think that you know it's it's just innate, really. Um, I mean, we were guided by our own set of ethics, I think, and just by who we are as individuals and as a team. And for us, you know, um, there were certain criteria that footage had to meet in order to make it into the series and materials had to meet in order to make it into the series. So in a way, I think we were doing what I imagine journalists do, which is, you know, we were trying to use primary source materials, we were fact checking, we were, to the extent possible, corroborating um, before using any of that material or footage in the series. So, you know, obviously, we were working as thoroughly as we could. We had more than a thousand hours of footage. We had, I must have read tens of thousands of, you know, pages of documents from, uh, there were at least, I think, five legal matters that, you know, we covered in the series. There was um, the 1985 wrongful conviction. There was the Attorney General's investigation and ultimate report questioning whether there had been criminal or ethics violations in the 1985 case. There was um, the Avery Task Force that was formed. It was a legislative yeah. task force with a goal towards, you know, how can we prevent this sort of thing from happening again. There was the federal civil rights lawsuit that Steve Glenn and Walt Kelly, who were representing Stephen, helped him bring, um, you know, to try to address any alleged malfeasance that had occurred in the first case. All of that before you even get to the Hallbuck case. And then the Hallbuck case was touted as the largest criminal investigation in Wisconsin history. So, you know, by the time we got to even looking at the materials in the Hallbuck case, there was, you know, there was so much available to us. And we knew that we were telling a 20 plus year long story and that for us, we would be gathering the materials, doing the research, trying to understand as deeply. Um, and as broadly as we could the material and then trying to distill it and you know to tell a compelling story mm -hmm. and try to maximize viewer engagement right. you know we also made the decision going in um, in terms of talking to people that we always wanted to we were only interested in talking to people about their first-hand experience you know we, we don't have any you know experts in the field just talking about the concept of something. It's somebody who worked on the case or, and um, so in that way there's, there was a, I mean that's not exactly fact checking, but you know, people are only speaking to their, from their, from their experience and mm -hmm. that's all they're allowed to talk about. Yeah. So 
there's a certain subjectivity to that, but it's also broad. Right. Even so, I think some people, and I'd be interested to hear what you have to say, some people have sort of complained that you have left things out and that, you know, you've shaded this story mm -hmm. uh, in some way and, mm -hmm. you know, questioned your ethics in that way. Mm -hmm. What would you say about that? Um, well, I disagree with those people. <laughs> um, I don't think they know as much about the story as they would like to let on yeah. and they know nothing about our process so right. you know they could ask us about our process and we could discuss you know specific things with them of why that you know I've heard a lot of accusations why didn't you put this in it's like well because if you look into it it's actually not true right. that's why it's not in there yeah <laughs> good for you <laughs> but all, you know also um, you know obviously people can question our process, that's valid, and we, we could respond if given the opportunity, and we're happy to respond, and mm -hmm. we think that our work stand, would stand up to any scrutiny. Um, but beyond that, you know, and this sort of gets back to the initial question of innocence, I mean, we did not assume an advocacy role here. Right. You know, we were not interested in having an impact, in fact, we worked very hard not to have an impact on the cases. Um, you know, we chose Stephen's story. He was a vehicle for us in a way. I mean, um, you know, we we received the James Joyce Award last night, and I was I was looking up some things about Joyce, and there was one quote in particular. It was something to the effect of, you know, um, through the particular comes the universal, mm -hmm. and and. You know, so here we were trying to tell a human story. Stephen Avery was a human face about, you know, the functionality um, of the American criminal justice system. And so through the particular of his story, we were hoping to raise bigger questions, bigger themes, um, and not only about the criminal justice system, but more about, you know, who we are as a people today. And, you know, questions of identity and mm -hmm. how we relate to one another. How do we treat people who are different than us? And so, you know, questions of fairness, um, of institutional power versus individual rights, you know, these are the things that really concern us, especially today. And um, although, I mean, they're both timely and timeless. These are questions I'm sure people have grappled with for forever. Um, and you know questions of accountability yeah. and if something does go wrong if the system does get it wrong will it endeavor to correct itself you know will that's someone, always the question yeah so you know I was saying last night it would be nice if when injustice is exposed as it was I believe in the 1985 case you know would someone from the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department or the prosecutor's office come forward and off, just offer an apology to Stephen know. Avery and say, you lost nearly two decades of your life, your wife, your five children, your six-day-old twins. That man doesn't deserve an apology from the system. You know, and then the state's attorney general, she's the highest you know, um, prosecutor in the state. She's in a position to investigate what went wrong and ultimately decides no criminal or ethics violations here. When you look at deposition videos in the federal case and you understand how Eugene Couchet came to draw the composite of Stephen Avery in 1985, you know, or the fact that, um, you know, I mean, arguably the fact that there was a, a police officer who went and spoke to the sheriff of Manitowoc County and said, I think you have the wrong guy. It's not Stephen Avery, it's Gregory Allen. You know, so those are the things we're yeah. interested in, and it just, you know, anyway, I don't know if I answered your question about specific <laughs> evidence, but. <laughs> we, you know, we are open to the idea of continuing to follow Stephen's case and Brendan's case. Um, you know, it's not a sure thing. In a, in any kind of documentary, you sort of have to keep an eye on what's going on, right. be open to it, maybe do a little filming, but you don't 
you don't know what's going to happen and whether it will warrant another episode, another several episodes. You know, part of that might also include... Another 10 years. Right. right. <laughs> if we did additional episodes for the series, it would certainly be about the same case. You know, although the public's response, the world's response to the series is becoming part of the case and part of this global discussion about justice, so that could be part of it as well. You know, because it's so much of... You know, there were moments in January and February as, as the series was coming out and people were, you know, these corporate media outlets were talking nonstop about this case that it felt like, this isn't this part of the series? This, aren't we back in 2005 here? You know, it was very deja vu that, yeah. you know, have we, have we come farther? Now it's a 35-year story, you know? Yeah. Um, so we're, we're definitely open to... Um, exploring more episodes of this um, and we're also looking at other projects both documentary projects and fiction projects Great. Yeah. it was challenging though in a way because if you think about the Avery's and when we entered their life that was around January of 2006 so it was just a couple of months after we first read about Stephen about a month after he and his family had to confront the fact that um, he was going to be proceeding to trial and facing charges that could put him away for life. So they were quite vulnerable and um, you know we appreciate the fact that they let us in and I think that really was a product of um, you know us just making clear to them that we were there not to judge, we were there to listen and to try to capture their experience and to ultimately share that with people um, so that people really could have an appreciation for the experience, <clears throat> excuse me, of being accused in the American criminal justice system. So um, they put a lot on the line, I think, in trusting us and we respected that and appreciated that. And, you know, but it was, it was challenging at times because Mrs. Avery, you know, both Mr. and Mrs. Avery were like, they would give us a hard time sometimes. And were they? Moira was the one with the camera all the time. I was, you know, interacting with them, and, you know, Alan would give Moira a hard time about, oh, there you are with the camera again, you know, <laughs> the microphone sticking out and sort of thing. But, um, but they were, yeah, they were good sports, and they trusted us, and they let us in, and gave us, you know, really intimate, amazing access. As far as Stephen, he was incarcerated the entire time we were filming, so we were able to see him at court, um, you know, get as close to him when he was being paraded into and out of the courtroom, um, and then beyond that, we would have phone calls with him that we would. So record. you didn't actually go visit him; you just were on the phone with him. And we did visit him okay. actually, but we weren't really able to visit him in the capacity we would have liked. We were not allowed to bring in cameras or any type of recording equipment, so we were able to only to record telephone conversations with him. Yeah. There's something very profound in this particular type of relationship because these are people who nobody believes, and so you're acting as a witness for somebody that the world doesn't believe. It's a particularly interesting relationship. I don't know, did you, did you find that? I mean, you know, I think your point about being a social worker is, I mean, I think there is a similarity. I mean, of course you become, you know, these are people we care about. I mean, we care about really all, the, all of our subjects in the mm -hmm. film. We spent a lot of time with the Averys and we saw them in a lot of pain. And mm -hmm. we saw them go through a lot of things I hope I never have to go through. Right. So, you know, but that's, that's empathy and, yeah. you know, we try to carry that in the way that we asked questions. As Laura said, we were there to listen, not to judge, which really made us stand out from everybody else in the media that, mm -hmm. that was, you know, driving onto their property with cameras rolling and rushing into the office or their doorsteps. So, um, we were just sort of sponges, you know, to to sort of accompany them mm -hmm. on this journey. Yeah, right? I think um, it's, it was a great choice. But Thank you. how did it, this impact? You mentioned it, it changed you. How do you think this series has changed your lives? Boy, I don't, can 
Can you please talk? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I certainly went in with certain assumptions about the world, like if people in power go unchecked, that's probably not a good thing. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, what you see on the news is probably not the whole story. Right. Sort of basic things like that. But certainly had no understanding really of how things work or how complex it was, you know. I think I probably thought, you know, the evidence that comes into the courtroom is probably the most important thing about <laughs> whether somebody is decided guilty or innocent, and I certainly don't believe that anymore. You know, there are so many ingredients, yeah. with, you know, social status, the pretrial media coverage, all of those things, you know. As you see in the series, they're going through juror questionnaires, and, you know, they have one person who says he might be innocent. Every other juror, you know, absolutely guilty. So, you know, that's where you're starting before any evidence has been presented. So what the hell does evidence matter yeah. at that point? So certainly just in terms of my understanding of, of how these cases or how cases in general like get decided mm -hmm. had a huge effect. But I also think just on the sort of, I think it empowered me as an individual, as somebody who had, you know, I spent a lot of time, it, it, it's a new thing for me to be talking. I spend a lot of time watching and listening, <laughs> and that's very much akin to being a documentarian. You have your camera, you have your microphone, and you're there witnessing. And then to be able to, to witness something and bring it to the world and think that it matters what you see mm -hmm. and that you have the power as somebody to document something that other people are shoving under the rug, you know, that's an empowering thing. Right. So I think what you're referring to is um, you know, the March 1st and March 2nd press conferences that the prosecutor, Ken Kratz, gave about Brendan Dassey and the statements that were attributed to Brendan. Um, you know, as we tried to show in the documentary in episode three, those were highly publicized press conferences. You know, news vans lined up. People, you know, trotted out to hear what Ken Kratz had to say, and he essentially gave an opening statement. Right you know, um, leaving very little room for doubt. He said something to the effect of, you know, we now know exactly what happened on October 31st of 2005. Incredible. And, you know, that was only after he, he gave a warning that, you know, children under the age of 15 should tune out now. Turn you off know. the TV. Yeah. yeah, essentially giving, as Dean said to us, you know, essentially giving um, an R rating to his own press conference. So, you know, we had our own experience of that, but then it was really interesting, I think, to see how the media covered that particular press conference. And what we include in episode three is that very thing. I mean, there's Aaron Keller, who does his stand-up on television and is standing outside the county jail where, where Stephen's being held awaiting trial. And he's saying, you know, something to the effect of, you know, pieces of a sick puzzle, you know, that Ken Kratz lays out. Um, and then there's, you know, like the kind of music that <laughs> the you know the nightly news is using in this montage, this video montage, and you're seeing you know Brendan's mugshot and all of this stuff, and it's just it's quite salacious, and you know essentially they're channeling the prosecution's narrative, and they're benefiting from it. You know, it's it's drawing in viewers and it's having people make sure they don't miss the five o'clock news or the six o'clock news, as opposed to anybody actually, you know, sort of stepping back and questioning what's going on here. Because I, I alluded earlier to the you know, the code of ethics and if you look at the rules of ethics in Wisconsin, I believe that, you know, Ken Kratz potentially violated a number of those rules and probably should have been sanctioned for that particular press conference. And instead, well, we know how you know, rarely that happens, I right. think that prosecutors are ever sanctioned. Yeah. So. What would you think would be the dominant salient themes of what goes wrong in the system? Well, first I would like to say that I think your observations are very, are very um, accurate and, you know, you're, you're he loves we, to be right. <laughs> we certainly have the same thing. I mean, you know, the human phenomenon of tunnel vision, for sure, goes on in investigations. And, and I think you're correct, too, in observing that the, the prosecution and the police are, are not so separate. 
in the states as, as perhaps they are here. They're more separate here. I wouldn't say that they're, they're not connected. They right. are connected. There are more safeguards. I'm not going to make a press conference. A prosecutor in this country would be sanctioned. Right. There's no question. And it would, as well as an active user, it would probably result in an application being made to prevent a trial from going ahead on the basis of what's called prejudice, pre-trial or misdemeanor mm -hmm. prejudice. That would unquestionably be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it's been fascinating for us to, um, to travel doing some of this PR because in so many other countries, that sort of pre-trial press conference would you know, would be thrown out, would maybe get the case thrown out. Sure. Whereas in the US, you know, that's far from what happened. In fact, it's a big part of why Ken Krebs won his case. Yeah. So, um, but to get to your question of what are some of the sort of underlying problems or the common problems, um, I mean, I think some of it gets to what Laura was talking about, that, you know, there is no simple fix. It's not about, you know, DNA evidence or one particular legislative reform, but you know, really confronting these issues of are are we as human beings, you know, able to have empathy for people that are different from us, able to, you know, think that this other person deserves exactly to be treated exactly the way I would like to be treated. You know, I'm not sure how many jurors go in embracing that concept. Right. So. Um, you know, or as Dean Strang talks about, of um, you know, he calls it the lack of humility of everybody involved. Their certainty that they're getting it right. Whereas, you know, if something is a process, if something is a system, and everybody just has one slice of their job to do, it's not it's not the police's job to solve the crime. They gather evidence, and it's not um, the juror's job to solve the crime. So I think, I mean, what we noticed was certainly people taking on more, maybe their, people's egos getting too big, but people taking on more than was their role. Yeah. Um, you know, not trusting the process, not trusting the system. So, you know, if there's a police officer who plants something because they don't believe a fair trial would result in a fair verdict, so they need to amplify the case. Damien sure Eccles, it happens the way they know is the right way. Right, Damien Eccles, who was one of the West Memphis Three and was um, wrongfully convicted, uh, he says that uh, when he's asked why this happened to him, he says, "I can tell you in one word, ambition." Mm -hmm. so. Well, as I mentioned earlier, there were you know there were certain criteria that footage had to meet in order to make it into the series and you know part of that was um, about just how we structured our own narrative essentially I mean we when we did the deal with Netflix initially it was going to be an eight episode series and so we had arced out an entire season and we you know that was everything from you know um, how many acts are in a particular episode, you know, what are the scenes within those acts, like, you know, how are we keeping Steven alive throughout the series, because, as I said earlier, he was incarcerated the whole time, and this is his story, um, you know, who are the window characters who are going to help us better understand him and his family, so, um, you know, our training actually is in narrative filmmaking, fiction filmmaking. So we really approached it in a way um, as storytellers um, and applied narrative techniques. And, um, you know, because we wanted this to be experiential. So that was really, um, we knew that you know, in a in a good fiction story, you have to have momentum, you have to have conflict, you have to properly introduce characters, you you know can plant things that pay off later, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, so all of that came into the mix. We also decided that because this was a, such a complex, layered, epic story, that we would tell it chronologically, but sometimes we would you know revisit something and you'd get a new perspective on it. So for instance, um, 
in episode three when Kratz has, you know, he gives his press conference on March 2nd, and we sort of internally were referring to that as Kratz has his day. You know, it's his moment to shine, it's his moment to say, this is what Brendan Dassey told us, here's what we now know, but then later we start to hear from Barb and Jody how that confession came about to begin with. Yeah. You know, the, the so-called road to Brendan. And then we sit down with Jerry Buting, who's one of Stephen's lawyers, and Dr. Larry White, who can begin to deconstruct that confession. Yeah. So I think through, um, you know, just the ethical guidelines we had, the, the criteria we had sketched out for what makes it in, what doesn't, and then the narrative techniques we applied, um, all of that, and you know, just always keeping in mind what's the objective here, what are we trying to achieve, all of that really came first and you know, kept any sort of emotion that we would have about these things out of it, really. On behalf of Griffith College and the Law and Journalism faculty and the Irish Innocence Project at Griffith College, I can't thank you enough. We have a little thank you. <laughs> Thank you.